Hello again, everybody. Welcome to the third in the series on oral communication. Now we'll talk about how you're actually going to deliver this talk. First one was how you plan it, then how you prepare your slides. Now we're actually going to stand and deliver your presentation. So first question might be, well, what are you going to wear when you get up there? Research has shown that you should wear something that makes you feel comfortable, intelligent, and attractive. When you feel comfortable, intelligent, and attractive, you'll have more confidence, and this confidence will translate. If you're speaking with more confidence, people tend to take you more seriously. Now, this can take several forms. You can wear something that makes you feel comfortable, comfortable, attractive, such as maybe your favorite shirt, your favorite tie, some sort of outward combination like that. Or it could be a pair of your favorite socks. Maybe you're wearing socks with cartoon characters or a favorite t-shirt underneath a more formal outerwear. I believe Michael Jordan is famous for wearing his North Carolina shorts under his Chicago Bull shorts throughout his whole career. He just knew it from, from the interview. So he felt he was more confident wearing something underneath what everyone was seeing outside. You can do this both ways. You can either wear something that externally everyone can see or maybe something that you, only you know what you're wearing and it's like a little joke between you and the audience that you're wearing something that you think is fun that the audience can't see as well. You should dress for the occasion. For class presentations, I recommend to my students at minimum business casual, so shirt, slacks, that sort of thing. Try to not wear the jeans if all possible. Definitely no short shorts, ratty t-shirts, anything like that for class presentations. More formal presentations, such as an undergrad thesis defense, master's defense, PhD defense, break out the suit. You only have a few select times to do that. At conferences, it depends. Some conferences I go to, everyone is wearing a suit. And the gentlemen are in full suits, shirts, ties. Uh, women are simply dressed, very formal business dress. Other conferences I go to are universally more casual. So then business casual would be dressing up at one of those conferences. So you just have to dress for the occasion, know what the environment is to dress for the occasion in an appropriate way. So your title slide. Last video we talked about what it should contain. So what do you do when you're up there? If someone's introducing you, you should acknowledge the introduction if there is one. So if someone says, and here's Rob, he's going to talk about giving an effective oral presentation, I would say, thank you for the introduction, and I would go into my talk. You don't need to reintroduce yourself. If you haven't been introduced and no one is there to introduce yourself, then you should reintroduce yourself. But don't reintroduce yourself. If someone says, and here's Rob, don't get up there and say, well, thank you. I'm Rob, and I'm going to talk about this. My name hasn't changed in the past 10 seconds, so I don't need to repeat what the other person just said. Similarly, I don't need to repeat the title if someone had already read it word for word. Maybe what you might want to do is paraphrase things. I'm like, well, that's a lot of words. What I'm basically going to talk about today is this. Maybe you summarize or rephrase or something like that, but don't repeat what the other person just said. That actually makes you look more nervous because if you repeat your name, your title, exactly how the other person said it, that has a tendency to make people leave. You're so wrapped up in your own head and focused on what you're trying to do, you're oblivious to the whole world around you. And if you're, and sometimes it's even funny how people ignore blatantly things that are happening around them during your talk. This way it shows that you're comfortable interacting with the person giving you an introduction, playing with the audience, all that, all that sort of thing. Again, if you have a sponsor listed on this title page, you should thank the sponsor then, or maybe thank the sponsor a little bit later. But in general, act relaxed and act comfortable to be up there when you're giving the title slide. The title slide sets the tone for your talk, so be comfortable and be confident when you're giving it. As you're going throughout the talk, like you mentioned in part two of this series, Repeat your key points at the beginning and middle of the end with your short internal summaries throughout. So get in the habit of preparing to do this and delivering it in a confident way so that you're telling a good story how one thing leads into the other. For these plots and figures, when you show the plots and figures, and remember only one per slide most typically, read the axes out loud, tell the audience what they're looking at, is this good or bad, and explain the figure slowly. If you explain it too quickly, and the audience can't figure out what you're doing, they are going to tune out. And if they tune out and they stop listening or they're totally confused at what you're showing them, they're going to panic and then you're done. They're not going to be listening to you for any more of the presentation. 
So on this figure, as I showed from the last presentation, I have on the y-axis average peak pressure in inside of a knee joint, and under and on the x-axis we have a variety of different conditions. What we're doing in this experiment is testing two types of implants for osteochondral defects, or basically holes in the cartilage of the knee. Here we have an autograft where we took from the same knee of an individual, and here we have a synthetic graft that we got from a company. So in the native knee, before we made a hole in these knees, the peak contact pressure between these uh, two bones in your knee under a given load was the same. When we made a hole in, in the knee, in the knee, and then measured the pressure there, it was just slightly above zero based on the stress on the outs outside of this hole and other noise in the system, but more or less there's no contact pressure in, 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 in a hole. So then after we put in this initial plug, whether it's an autograft or a synthetic plug, we saw that we had higher peak pressures in the autograft compared to the synthetic graft when we first put the plug in, when we cycled the knees a couple of times in a materials testing machine, and then after we cycled it a few more times in a materials testing machine. This actually confirms a hypothesis that the synthetic graft would have lower pressures than the autograft. So what I did there is I explained what all the different colors lines were, what all the axes were, and all those other things so that someone could easily follow along with what's going on. Take the time to do this. Too many people forget to read the axes, forget to explain what the colors are, and then mo moreover forget to explain is this good or bad. Tell the story, take the time, it'll pay off at the end. But how much time should you take? Well, you know how to do this because you'll practice it. The rule of thumb is basically one minute per slide, but that's a sort of generic rule of thumb. Some slides need more time, some slides need less time. Your title slide may be very quick if you're just going to go through it. Uh, just say your name in the title, or maybe you're taking some time on the title slide to really set the stage for your whole presentation, which case you'll take more time. Depends on your own style, depends on your own type of slide as well. Different people have different speaking styles. I gave one presentation, practice presentation in class, and I was, I'm typically very animated when I speak, which is ironic given I have a have a speech impediment that you may or may not have seen on this lecture series already, but I'm typically very animated. I kind of speak very loudly and somewhat quickly, which my wife says at home, you don't need to shout shout out of her when I'm in the kitchen. I just get all excited and, and animated, that sort of thing. So I gave this presentation to the class, and one of the students says, do I need to speak as quickly as you? No, you don't have to speak as quickly as me. You can speak faster than me, slower than me, as long as it's your own style and style fits you but you'll know how much time it's going to take because you're going to practice it, and you're going to know it by practicing. What I do when I practice in front of the computer at home, I usually add about a minute onto that presentation, anywhere between 30 seconds and a minute of additional time. So if it's a 10-minute talk, I want to finish at home at about 9.30. Over the years, I figured out Odds of me stammering at some time during my presentation are pretty good. So I'm going to bank in 30 seconds for any, any speech disfluencies that I might have. Or I may start to ramble on other topics, building off of the people who came before me, people who are going to come after me, things we heard at the conference prior to, to my session. I want to give myself a little bit of wiggle room, whether for things I want to add in or for a stammering that I don't want to add in. It's about 30 seconds per talk. So I kind of have developed that over the years. If you haven't developed that over the years, what do you do? You practice. You practice, you practice, you practice. Practice and you practice some more. You practice by yourself, in the car, in the shower, in front of the mirror, when you're walking the dog, when you're watching the game, during the commercials, wherever. You will practice and practice and practice. You'll do it out loud. You'll do it. You'll time yourself. When you time yourself, it'll be like what I said on the last slide. You know what to add in or you know what to, to cut out. You should practice for your roommates. They may know nothing at all about the topic that you are talking about, but they'll tell you if you're speaking too softly or too slowly or too, or too quickly or too loudly, if you have pacing, if you're twitching, if you're shaving your head, shaking your head back and forth. Any of these things that you can't pick up on your own, practice, practice, practice for other people, offer to cook them dinner, buy them beer, do their laundry, whatever you need to do to encourage your roommates to help you out, take, take them 
uh, out for a nice restaurant, whatever it might be, figure out what the currency is between you and your friends so they can help spot these things for you. Make sure that they also understand how you're trying to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them and tell what you told them. So these internal transitions that you're doing throughout your talk should ensure that you're telling a good story to anyone who's listening to you. You should make contact with your audience. You should make eye contact with them. So it should be you're conversing with them like I'm trying to converse with you here and you are engaging with them. So you're engaging in a more reasonable conversational type tone. You're not in there just going to stare at them. Sometimes you go and you stare at people and it tends to make them nervous if you're just staring at them the whole time and that tends to freak, freak them out. Other times it looks like more of a typewriter. I'm going to look over here at the audience, here, 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 here. Okay, I did that row. Now I'll go down a row, here, 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 down that row. Then you go through the whole audience, boom, and you go back to the top. And it looks artificial, like you're purposely trying to scan everyone in the audience. So don't zero in on one person and don't kind of do a machine marching away on the rest of the audience. Engage with them, make it like you're trying to have a nice casual conversation with them. Don't read directly at the slide, so don't, I'm not looking down here trying to look just at the slides, are saying, so don't look directly at your computer screen. Worse of all, don't look at your computer screen. Don't pull out some notes and say, okay, I'm just going to read from my notes I hear on my slide here. I've ever seen people grab notes and put them up in front of them so they're reading up a piece of paper in blocking their view of the audience. That adds no value. You reading from the slides, reading from a piece of paper, I've had other people do that. It does nothing. It has no meaning. You just put a robot up there and they can read it for you. Don't talk to the computer screen. I have had people, again, staring at the laptop they're presenting. I've had other people turn around and read to the screen behind them and not look at the audience. And where they're kind of dancing around in the back, waiting for them to turn around, and they never do. You'll develop in your own style how to do this, how you're gesturing to the audience, looking at the audience, engaging with the audience. This is your own style. You'll develop your own style. If you don't have your own style yet, you will fake it. Act like you'll want to be there, and if you have to, fake it if you have to. You should enjoy being up there. Act like you want to be up there. If you don't act like it, people won't take you very seriously and you're very, very interesting to listen to. If you have to fake it to act like you're up there, do so, and eventually you'll get more and more used to giving these presentations. I have a couple people in the past who've been scared to death to stand up in front of the audience, and they you could tell at the beginning they were almost gritting their teeth and forcing themselves to enjoy it be up there. At the end of the year, they got much better, much more comfortable, and one of these students even wrote me a year or two later where she was giving presentations in, in grad school at a different university, said she was having a really great time, really enjoys giving the talks, and just started by forcing herself to get up there. Pointing devices are great, particularly with the laser pointer. You can point to what you're talking about on the slide, but be careful if you're using a laser pointer, so make sure you know how it works before you get up there. Don't wave it around. This is not a lightsaber as much as engineers prefer to use lightsabers in which they had them. You don't have a lightsaber up there. Don't point to everything. Just don't, don't be pointing to every little thing on the slide that tends to distract from the focus. Don't flash it on and off. Don't strobe at it. Know how it works. So don't get up there and point the laser and have the thing shine on your chest. I've seen too many people do that. They can't figure out why it's not showing up on the screen because if it's a big glowing green thing, then they flip it around and look down at it and they'll blind themselves in the face. I've seen it. Don't do it. Make sure you know how, 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 how to use it. Be careful if you're too nervous. If you have a laser point in your hand and you're nervous, it starts bobbing around. It will look like you're nervous. So one thing you might be able to do is rest one hand down on a table and go like this so that if you're getting a little bit of stability from the one hand while using it the others. Sometimes you even have people in the audience point for you, maybe friends from your lab. If they're pointing a the laser at the screen, you have nothing in your hands, and all of a sudden a magic laser appears on the screen. It looks kind of cool if you could coordinate it that way. Other people have used good old s sticks as laser, laser pointers. I'm a biomechanist, so I use some saw bones or bones sometimes as pointers. I had one guy come to class. He literally got a branch out of a tree that fell on the ground, so he had a six-foot long, six long branch he brought to class because he was presenting on a really big screen. It worked. It was a little weird that he had a huge tree branch with him, but it did work for his purposes. 
don't play with your hair. So I cut my hair short so I don't have this problem. So you can't, I can't sit here and twirl my hair or lament on how much hair I don't have. Don't play with your hair, your keys in your pocket, watches, rings, or watches, rings, other jewelry that become distracting very quickly. You are not coaching baseball so that I adjust my tie, tip my cap, wipe here, this. You're not giving signs at third base. Don't play with all those things. Keep your hands out of pocket so no jingling of things you have in your pockets. At the same time, don't just stand there straight like a statue. That looks a little abnormal as well if you're just standing here like a statue. I'm Italian, so I'm actually more animated. I speak with my hands. So some kind of balance between standing still enough, but not just uh, standing there completely still. I believe it was Bill Clinton, who was a gifted orator, that they studied some certain hand gestures and what they mean. And they found out that the thumbs up was very positive, but looks kind of goofy if you give too many thumbs up. The fist conveys strength, but it also conveys ag aggression. So they tried to figure out a way to pair positiveness with strength, and he came up with this type of motion. If you watch any of Bill Clinton's speeches, he gives a lot of this, so a lot of emphasizing with strength with the thumb, combination between strength and aggression and the positive thumbs up. Use the, you can use these to your advantage. But we're giving these gestures, don't flap around like a bird, don't keep waving so wild it looks like you're gonna take off from the screen. And also don't beat the screen behind you, so don't stand there and start banging on the screen behind you drumming on the table in front of you. I have someone this year who, when they're talking, does this, and he doesn't know he's doing it until we videotaped him, he saw it. I had a guy, whenever he talked, he'd stand up there, point and slap, point and slap, point and slap. And he, we all saw it, but he didn't see it until his video, then he saw himself beating himself in the leg, and this very loud slapping noise. He watched himself, he's like, oh no, that's what I'm doing. He's worked to correct it then. So careful with what you're doing with your hands. Also avoid the, um, yeah, like, so, you know, sort of, kind of, maybe, maybe, so, yeah. Don't feel like you have to fill the space with these transition words. Also avoid the, <coughs> <coughs> type noises. Because what happens, one, it gets annoying, but if you do too many of them, audience will count. My record doing a 10-minute talk is 116. I remember this one speaker who was giving a talk on a topic I was legitimately interested in said, um, 116 times. Now, I usually give people the benefit of the doubt for the first minute or so. So I would get estimate in about nine minutes, or maybe a little over nine minutes, this person said, um, 116 times. I was just sitting there counting, one, two, three, four, slash, one, two, three, four, slash. If I'm doing that, I'm not listening to you, and it just becomes very distracting. Some other quick notes here at the end. Don't apologize for the bad slides. Why? Not because you're angry, because you made them. If you know you're making a bad slide, and people usually say, I apologize, this slide is confusing. Why did you make a confusing slide in the first place? Make the slide clear enough so you don't have to apologize for it. If it's that bad, don't make it that bad. Make it cleanly and well done the first time so you don't have to feel like you have to apologize as you're giving it. Don't ignore the horrible interruptions. Cell phones in a small room, coughing fits, people coming in late and making this big scene. We all see it, you see it. Acknowledgement and move on. During your talk, you should not have to grab a marker and draw something. If you have to draw something on the board during your talk, it shows that you're unprepared. Because if you really needed that figure in the first place, it was already in the, it should have already been in the presentation. Now, if during question and answers, someone asks you a question and the best way to do it is to grab the marker and to start to draw, that's perfectly fine to go and do that during a question and answer period. Or you could have extra slides or these so-called bonus slides at the end of your talk. You just advance to those slides at the end. But during a Q&A, it's perfectly acceptable to grab the marker and draw, and draw things there as well, not during the meat of your talk. If you needed it in there, you should have already had it. Speaking of those questions, people are not out to get you, typically. 
the really nasty, nasty questioners are not at your own school or even at a conference by and large. But when you're answering these questions, it's important you don't try to oversell your results, don't speculate or don't BS people. If you have a limitation, acknowledge it. We probably see it, so acknowledge it yourself and say it's a limitation. Stick with the results you have presented, so don't try to oversell things or get more mileage out of it than what you actually do have. If you don't know, you don't know. It's okay to not know. Say I haven't looked into that aspect. You raise an interesting points, something I should look into further, or I don't know. I'll look into it. Thanks for bringing it up. It's much more respectable to acknowledge your own shortcomings and your own limitations than just try to make something up on the spot because the odds are you're going to make something up incorrectly, say something wrong, and then it's going to just go downhill quickly. So to summarize this one, dress for the occasion, tell a good story while you're explaining your figures, repeating your main points along the way, making sure the audience is along with you, and avoid the ums, the likes, the ohs, and the sads, and acting like a third base coach. Thanks for watching these three videos. Hopefully now you can give a fantastic oral presentation.